when you come here, when you come to the woods and the ponds, you get connected to nature, really, to life. It's just an openness happens. It's a... <sighs> I, I really, really uh, love walking this land. Um, I just love it. Well, my own ancestors have spent some time here. They first came over in the 1700s. They were pretty earthy. It was a great, great teaching for me. You know, I'm just starting to learn. The future of building and the future of quality living, if you will, is really based on whether or not we grasp and, and embrace timber framing again. I mean, I really feel Aaron is trying to preserve our culture and uh, what New England has a lot to be proud of. And I'm very, very proud of being a New Englander. I want us to build something that was a, was a great model uh, for others. I feel like uh, buildings in the U.S they aren't probably as efficient as they could be. It would help model sustainability and conservation. The most important thing we can do is lead by example to improve performance of a building by 90%. I have every confidence that the timber frames could last for a long, long time, 500 years, 1,000 years. For us, we're thinking of this 50 to 100 year uh, lock-in of performance. Matt with his focus on environmental sustainability is coming from the, the resource side of things. Aaron and his sensibilities are the sustainability of a structure and its ability to, to stand the tests of time. That's the even bigger challenge, I think, for the Lewis Gathering Center is how does it get used 200 years from now? Above all, this, this is about community. This property is about community and connecting the community. It's been going on for hundreds and hundreds of years. Oh, am I telling you? Everybody thought this was crazy. They really thought this was crazy. Now, Noma means becoming, becoming human, transforming. Now, we're watching a world that's just splintering apart here. How do you change community? How do you make a community come together? We've always been a community of farmers. It has never been a, uh, a, an upscale community. Phillips Exeter Academy, which is located in the next town over from us, is the oldest preparatory school in, in the United States. They wanted to come to Kensington in the 1700s. The local farmers would not let them because they feared the boys would steal the apples from their orchards. That, that is Kensington. <laughs> I, been a selectman. I was on the planning board for 30 years. I'm involved with the church on a volunteer basis. We'll work with the library whenever. Yes, I'm completely immersed in the town and its and its and its operations. There are a lot of places in Kensington that have not changed in over 60 years, including Alan's grandmother's house. My grandmother would say, "Come on outside. It's eight o'clock at night. Smell the ozone." Smell the ozone. I mean, I didn't even know what ozone was. What the hell is ozone? But I know the air smells great. He bought the travel agency in 1986, and it became successful rather quickly. I believe Harriet and I have been on this crazy journey since the early 70s. There was something about this town and this place that uh, we wanted to share with people. Alan and I and our family, we're very involved in a lot of nonprofit work, particularly around 
leadership training for nonprofit leaders. We also do leadership training for for-profit businesses, but like a different way to do business, right? A different, more heartfelt, more thoughtful, more human ways of doing business. And um, I think we it's been very, very successful. This year we'll have over 300 days up here. But we needed a different space. When it comes up, it's going to hang like this. Okay, we're going to walk it over. We're going to see if we can push it to plumb and come down. All right, we may not be able to. Down slowly. Down slowly, Dan. Okay, you got to speak up. Sorry. You need to look at the bottom of your post and see if you're going to line up with your four outside holes. You're really ro rolled. It's got a lot. We sent a few people from here to Maine to meet with Aaron and then meet with Matt. And I have to tell you, they came back, there's no way. There's no way they're gonna work together. I mean, there was no, I mean, I've told you. We have Aaron, who's a purist about frames. We have Matt, who's the design intent person, who's a purist about what he does and is involved in the minutia. From the very beginning, we're setting in motion these, these patterns of consumption. And if we're making the choice today to set in motion these buildings that are going to be high performing for 50 to 100 years using almost no energy or net zero, then we're doing our job. We're, being, we're acting responsibly. You know, we want to demonstrate something completely different. We want to not just talk about it, but do something that will make a difference and that we all believe in. When we started off, we did the prototype for the, the go home, which was our first passive house. And what we realized very quickly as it went through the first winter is it's a much better building. It used only around two or $300 for space eating all year long. And that was a sort of prototype for a a co-housing community that we're working on here in Belfast. It's 36 families divided into a number of different unit types. It's on a rural site and it was all about reducing the development footprint to maximize the surrounding undeveloped land area and there's a whole farming component to that. So the passive house standard is a 90% reduction in space heating demand, which is a conservation approach. So you're going to conserve the energy in the building by building a really good building envelope or building shell. So high insulation levels, triple glazed windows, and then air sealed with ventilation. Traditional building was designed to last 200 years. It was not intended to be short-lived. You were going to stay there forever. Um, we don't build like that in the United States anymore. We haven't for a long, long time, uh, except every once in a while we get an opportunity to do it. The Freedom Mill was the opportunity to see a project that was done by this group called Preservation Timber Framing in terms of restoring the integrity and the character of an original building. The foundation of the building are massive blocks of granite with a, a traditional mill building above it. And we went there to just experience this, this feeling and this, this, um, the, the heaviness of granite 
and the the water and the, the the relationship of a building to its environment and the the water coursing under the building and the strength of the water the strength of the building was something that was just overwhelming and Alan said if we can incorporate the beauty and the majesty and strength with the concepts of a sustainable building we have a we have a win When people came and used this building, what did we want to see happen? The first thought was it was a, a gathering a place, a place for people to come together and to learn together, to grow together, to practice yoga together, to come up with new um, ideas together. I don't know, when you see people's passion and they're alive, that's, that's it for me. Because I thought that was a way to really help communities in need and different organizations. Lots of different things about Native American culture speak to both of us. And so we found this word El Noba and we spoke to some Abenakis about it and they were saying this is a good word. It really means becoming human. We determined that in order to flesh that out, we had to do a 3D model. And Harriet walked into the room. Having not been involved, she knew that conceptually there was something going on. She walked into the room and looked at the 3D model and her immediate response was, Oh my God, oh my God. And it was gorgeous and it was beautiful. I just loved it. I did. I just loved it. Alan, he's the, the person who keeps saying, I'm not concerned about today. I need, to, I need to focus on what's going to be. One, two, three, four, five, six king posts in this 60-foot building. I mean, one of the reasons we did the king post, the double parallel raptor king post truss, is it allows for the entire span to be wide open. And that is, it's also a beautiful form. So when you look up at that truss, you're seeing a, a pure structural load being sent out to the outside wall in a beautiful and kind of a magical way. I love the shadows on it. This is the best way to utilize a tree of that size. It's by far the most sustainable and energy preserving method of building. If you can think about a tree and turning it into two by fours, the amount of energy it took to take a perfectly good tree that we could use as a post and turn it into 30 two by fours that's a lot of petroleum down the tube for very little gain because that is a short-lived building. So the framework, the way that we built it and the materials that we used in the form that we used them is a very sustainable part of this structure. <laughs> I liked Aaron because I, th I really believe he loved what he did. I think he was trying to preserve our culture. The early gallery frame is a posted frame like a barn, it is a barn. It's a barn from Green, Maine. Um, that type of barn would have existed anywhere from Massachusetts to, to the you know, northern Maine. It was very homogeneous. And it's a beautiful hand-hewn early frame from about, uh, it could be 1750, 1760 in that range. In some ways, Aaron for me is a bigger conservationist. You know, because it is, it's, it is wood from the 1700s. And, and I do believe he's got proof that they last a long, long time. Well, what we have is a 200-ish year old brace. This marriage mark here tells you exactly where it goes. It only goes in one spot. And as you can see, it's pretty old and weathered and it's still good. And we're gonna put it back in the building. There's nothing wrong with this. To bring a timber frame together was a community event. The meeting house, the church building, the town hall, they were all very large timber frames that were often literally brought together by the community, raised by the community. So you could call in half a dozen farmers to help lift a frame and make it happen. Because everyone was familiar with this kind of building and they certainly understood how it went together. The time-worn and proven technology of Aaron has centuries behind it. 
We are combining it with something that has less than decades behind it. To see that building sticking out like that, when it first went up, I mean, I was just, I said, oh my God, what did I do, you know? I mean, I was worse than in shock. I'm still concerned about how to mitigate that big building, you know, tone it down a little bit. Authenticity in my life is, a, in Harriet's life, it's a premium. At this stage, we, we know we have a finite amount of time. In that time, we wanted to spend with uh, people and things that are real. So Alan, when he was really young, like five, I think he was around five, would take the bus from the Boston area and he would come all the way up here to New Hampshire and there weren't the big highways then, so it was a little bit of a, a little bit of a ride. Then he'd get off the bus and go across the street to his grandmother. His grandmother lived right across the street. She would at first give Harriet a hard time. I mean, I'd bring her up and she'd serve me first, you know, not talk to her until she'd spoken to me, you know. And, uh, but she became very fond of Hattie. She called her Hattie. His uncle would be over there, his other aunts would be over there, and it was real family. And they would just go and do things. I mean, they would, they were very much connected to the land. You know, she was like a gathering place. She was a gathering place, and that's what her house was like. They had a lot of fun in the outdoors. I did too. That's how I was, you know, when I was up here, that's what I did. I'd be out in the, uh, in the woods, you know. wanted it to be in the woods and he wanted to be able to look through the building and see the woods and he's accomplished that with very large glass elements and that's not something that you would see on a traditional meeting house. Always from the beginning the entry to the building was going to be coupled with this reclaimed timber frame. So, I mean the gallery is a repurposed building. You know, it was a dairy barn, and then it got changed to a hay barn, and then they put horses in it. Then they got a bigger cow, so, and it kept changing and changing. The gallery was particularly difficult because we had that old 200-year-old frame that kind of found its shape over 200 years. It's wood, there's horses on it. The timber frame will expand and contract with climate because it's a natural material. We have a building, however, that needs to be quite precise. Steel, as you know, is quite straight. Clear, clean, modern material, clean line, easy to work with in that sense. The timber frame, which it's married to, is kind of moving all over the place. So the steel superstructure is really more for the exterior cladding and glass. They're using massive sized glass for this project. If the building moves, we're gonna have glass failure. The timber frame will expand and contract at different rates than glass and steel, and that marriage, how that's going to come together. So we're gonna to marry those two together. They both look at it differently, but I do think they're both conservationists. I, I wanna work with a team of people who really care what they're doing, they wanna push it, they wanna make it perfect. Aaron and his team clearly have that and they do that. But I feel like in moments of frustration, yeah, it's like, why don't we just separate these things and keep them s separate? It would be totally easy. We just assemble the frame within, it's shipping the bottle, right? But I don't think that's the building. You know, that's not what we've been asked to do. That's the balance that Matt struck. And it's not a terrible balance. It's not as traditional as you might expect for a building of this age, but is in fact a way to illustrate the building, make it relevant, make it viable, and have it used. It'll be a very, very interesting building. A 
lot of uh, New England's history comes from small, isolated uh, granite quarries that the townspeople or the town's craftsmen would go and actually quarry out blocks of granite for the grange, for the animal impounds. Part of this project, we, we reclaimed uh, from about a quarry over in the western part of New Hampshire. It has a long history and, and all the abandoned quarries throughout New England, Maine, and New Hampshire. People love stone because it ties the, the, the buildings to the earth. Alan does not like construction. I love construction. You know, just seeing different things happening, the next stage and the next stage, and choosing the stone for the fireplace. It's a thousand million different decisions, and I like that. You know, we, we worked into the, the big uh, lintel stone that goes over the, the top of the fireplace, and that stone's almost uh, 11 feet long. So it's a substantial stone. It's a key element to that whole fireplace. All the assemblies from the foundation, to the walls, to the windows, to the roof, to the mechanical systems, they all have to be mindful of connecting together so there's no air leakage. So the airtightness of the building is critical to Passive House. It can be up to 30% of a building's energy loss, which is just due to leaking. I wasn't gonna build it unless we had a fireplace. I wouldn't build it, I just wouldn't. I mean, I'm from here and, and uh, you know, we've been cutting wood since I was a kid. And fire, again, is an integral part of, of you know, community and, and bringing people together around fire. And I don't think of any building or any place that Alan would ever not want to have fire. So the challenge became, how do you put a fireplace as big as this fireplace, which is almost six foot wide, into a passive house where you're trying to keep the air infiltration in and out locked down? Because the heat demand for the building is so low, most of the heating for the building actually comes from the people who will be inside of it. Occupants or computers, lights, cooking, that's where most of the heat comes from. And so in a passive house, in order to be certified, you need to demonstrate the air tightness of the building. Because it's so airtight, there's no fresh air to draw from, so you're drawing from the room. So what we had to do is we had to supply a auxiliary air source or a fresh air source that is right in front of the fireplace so that we can, with a switch, open up the air source so when you light the fire, it draws directly from that air source rather than drawing it from the room. And uh, the jury's still out on how this building will perform. When we first came onto this site, Alan said that he did not want a building that was imposed. He wanted a building that felt as if it was developed within the landscape. In order to create the building, we had to destroy a portion of that which we were there for. So the, the objective of the replanting is to recreate that which was there originally and to accentuate it even more fully. We built the building along the edge of the forest knowing that we'd have to do tree planting around it to give it that feel of sort of moving through the trees into the building. We didn't just select varieties of trees, we selected individual trees. So of the 51 trees, each one of them has been identified specifically. So there is no random tree that's being planted around this building. <laughs> we have red oak, sugar maple, red maple, white birch, hemlock, and 
swamp white oak, which are all native trees um, that are indigenous. That's really what 300, 200, 300 years old wood. And here it is, it's still being used, right? It's still functional, it's still with, I don't know today how many things 300 years from now you'd be able to say, I'll take this part of the building and I'll put it in another building. The Passive House standard has three main components uh, in order to certify. Uh, on the first level, the annual heat consumption for the building. And we've passed that, we're good. The, the second is the primary energy, which is obviously related to the loads of the building and how the energy sources of the building, uh, where they're coming from, and the total energy that the building uses uh, as a whole. And we're good there. And the third is after construction is complete or at the end of construction, we have to do a pressurization test uh, the blower door test to ensure that the building has the air tightness level to meet the passive house standard. No. You know, so I wasn't going to build unless we had a fireplace. They said, well, it's not going to be passive. I said, well, it's not going to be passive, you know. You know, my goal wasn't to make it passive. My goal was to uh, have a great model that other people could, uh, that would help model sustainability and conservation. Everything that's being done is being done to such a level of, of certainty and to such exacting standards. You just hope that the, the, the torch will be carried. I'm very, very proud. I'm really proud of, of this building. I'm really proud of what everybody's done. You pause and you take in Mother Nature and you take in what's around you, and you, you look at the elements, and stone is one of them, you know, fire is another one. To slow down and you walk through the property and you walk through this building, I think you, you get the sense of where it all came from. I don't think in my lifetime I've seen that much talent, ego, uh, come together and work so well together. The mission and what Alan Lewis is trying to do here is long term. I mean, he's looking at sustainable systems with his solar systems and his, you know, all the environmental issue he addresses. That's what really got me pumped up to do this project. Keeping and appreciating the quality of place, particularly in New England, it's, there's a lot of heritage here. And to understand that, but also to create, bring something new to the dialogue, for me, is what gets me out of bed. I mean, I look almost every day when I'm here. I mean, I'm so thankful and, uh, to be here knowing I'm just part of time.
Vermont PBS, partnering with local filmmakers to bring you stories made here. For more, visit vermontpbs.org.